welcome everybody who's on already. We'll we'll wait a few minutes to give people a chance to to get in, uh, and then we'll get started. And a quick note for all of you that are just joining, uh, we are going to leave the Q&A session, the functionality at the bottom of this open. So you can ask questions throughout the session uh, during through the Q&A button down at the bottom of the screen. We'll get going in just a moment. All right, Casey, should we do this? Let's get going. Ready? Yep. Okay. All right, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Bryce Warning. I'm the Global Vice President of Business Development for Pattern. Uh, I will be co-hosting this with Casey. Uh, I'll let Casey introduce himself in a second. Uh, I spent seven years at Amazon, uh, four in the US. Uh, I And we'll give positions just so you know kind of what categories we dealt with. Uh, I was over in stock for Patio Lawn and Garden for a number of years, and then the DMM or the lead buyer for home improvement before going to Australia, helping launch Amazon Australia, where I helped with mass vendor recruitment for uh, the home and kitchen categories, and then was the category lead for consumer electronics. I've uh, been with Pattern for almost two years now, and I'll let Casey introduce himself. Thanks, Bryce. Uh, Bryce has beaten me out on my time at Amazon. Um, I was at Amazon for six years, and I spent three years on the home improvement team on the in-stock side as well as, as an MVM. And then I led the in-stock team over in pets and then led the vendor management team on automotive. I've been with Pattern for a little over two years now, and I lead our revenue operations team uh, where we get to uh, support brands as some of the data experts, as well as some of the marketplace experts, as most of my team are all former Amazonians as well. All right, let's jump into it. And I'll, I'll give the same announcement we did just a few minutes ago. Chat is turned off, the, the Q&A is turned on. Uh, and this is only as good as the questions we get. And so we really do appreciate any questions that you have. Please put them in there. We'll address them as we go, but that functionality is on. All right, we will jump in. So the goal of this is to talk through 1P, 3P, what are the potential benefits, challenges, what's the best model for your brand? Uh, we'll start it out by just acknowledging the fact that Casey and I have done this before. Uh, some of you may have seen recordings of the one that we've done before. And uh, so the topic and the content will be similar. Uh, a lot of the data and some of the slides are updated or different, but again, that's where Q&A, we will address different things based on the questions that are there. So we really do appreciate all of you who are here. Um, some of the information will be similar to what you've seen if you've seen us talk before, uh, but some of it will be new and updated. Uh, Casey and I do work for Pattern, but we will try to provide the most uh, non-biased view we can, having worked for both a third-party accelerator like Pattern and uh, internally at Amazon. 
and we're happy to discuss both models and the, the pros and cons to both. So let's jump in on that. I'll cover this slide. Um, first and foremost is we are going to talk about 1P versus 3P and benefits and challenges of both. Uh, it's It's been surprising to me, to Casey, how often we talk with the brand and we mention 1P and 3P and they don't know the difference. Uh, and I think we are a little jaded because we have worked internally at Amazon. We do work for a third party accelerator. And so we hear these terms all the time, but just to kind of get a lay of the land there, when we say 1P, that is first party. That is where Amazon invites you. It's an invite only um, to work directly with them. Amazon actually purchases or, or places a PO to purchase your product. You ship it into their warehouse and then Amazon takes control of that. Amazon controls the pricing. Um, they are the ones shipping the product. Uh, you'll see on a page, it'll say shipped and sold by Amazon. Uh, and so that's the one P side. You have a vendor manager, someone internally at Amazon who is managing that inventory, your brand, uh, and how it's sold on Amazon. When we talk about 3P or third party, that's anyone. Uh, that could be a brand. It could be a random person selling products out of their garage uh, can get onto Amazon and sell a product. They do have to get the products approved or be selling something that is approved on Amazon. Um, but that is a third party seller uh, who is selling either direct to the consumer. So I could sell it out of my house and ship it myself through UPS or whoever. Or you could be putting it into Fulfilled by Amazon, which is FBA, where you send it into Amazon's warehouse and then they ship it They ship it for you. And then on the product page itself, it'll say sold by Bryce Warning, shipped by either Amazon or whatever that, that seller is. Um, in that case, the pricing is controlled by the seller. Amazon is more just providing the traffic and the page for the, for the customers to look at, but you control everything else. That's the, the high level view of 1P versus 3P. We just wanna get that out there. Those are the terms that we're gonna to use to describe both of those. Um, but as you'll see, there are, there are varying degrees of what those mean and, and we'll jump into that now. So Casey, why don't you start us off on the left side of the screen here? Yeah, thanks Bryce. One of the key things that Bryce and I try to provide for different brands is a little bit of a framework of how to think through the different models. Most people have heard of 3P and 1P, but may not have heard of some of these other ways. And it gets a layer deeper than just thinking 3P and 1P, as within those models, you can sell in different ways as well. So what we've tried to outline in this framework is a little bit of the benefits and drawbacks from each of these strategies and we'll go through maybe a quick example or a quick thought through each of these to kind of highlight how to think through each of these models. And you can then look and say, where do you fit within each of these different selling strategies and which one may fit your future strategy as you look forward. This first one we talk about is 3P unmanaged. Uh, Bryce, I like to think of that or call that the 3P Wild West as well, because this one is very simple. It's the idea that you are almost ignorant to your products being sold on Amazon. Uh, some brands that we talk to have some history with Amazon or absolutely hate Amazon and have decided, I don't want to sell or be affiliated with Amazon. Some people just don't understand Amazon and don't know how to get their feet wet and have said, I'm not going to sell anything on Amazon. However, almost every single time we see that, you can go onto Amazon and you can find their products. So the benefits here, as we listed, ignorance is bliss. It's kind of nice to not have to worry about it or think about it. However, the biggest drawback is that with over 50% of all consumer searches starting on Amazon, people are going there to look for your products. And if you're not there selling it, someone likely is. We just talked with a brand recently who's doing over $30 million on Amazon and didn't even know that they were selling on Amazon, but other people were selling their products on their behalf. Those other sellers, unfortunately, are taking their own images and pictures or copying images from sometimes illegal places and putting them up and representing the brand on their behalf. Uh, sometimes that's images in a garage or whatnot, but you lose all the control from your branding, from pricing, from content, 
And the experience may be totally different for a brand if they're selling on Amazon and not paying attention to it versus their own D2C site or other websites. So this is one that we highly recommend brands move away from if you're involved in this strategy, uh, but we do understand some of the benefit there. Bryce, uh, maybe dive into 1P a little bit more. Yeah, we'll jump from the, the extreme on the 3P side to maybe the extreme on the direct with Amazon side. So 1P, I've discussed it a little bit, but let's, let's hit it from the benefits and drawbacks standpoint. Uh, this is where you're selling directly to the retailer. So in a brick and mortar setting, this might be like getting a PO from Home Depot and they're placing it on the shelf for you. Um, similar uh, where you're getting an upfront PO, you have that direct contact with the retailer. Um, although that can be painful because you don't always have just a day-to-day -day person to reach out, out to. Uh, and also this is, um, they should be important brands, important products to Amazon. In some cases, Amazon is willing to sell those at a loss. Uh, so a product where maybe on your own, you may not want to ship it across the country and sell it on Amazon. Uh, 1P, they might be willing to do that because of the importance to the traffic and customers that are coming onto the site. Drawbacks there is uh, a lot of this relates to control. So no pricing control. Uh, we won't go super, super deep into this, but Amazon does match to multiple retailers. They want to be competitively priced uh, and they control that pricing aspect for your brand when you sell to them directly. Um, inventory control, even though you are getting upfront POs, um, the forecast can change a lot based on a lot of different variables, seasonality, different things that are happening. And so it's not always consistent. Uh, and then there are fees that are paid. You're, you're paying to have Amazon take control of that for you. Um, and so there's, there's benefits and drawbacks to that side of it. The other one that we hear a lot is the brand manager turnover. You know, oh, my vendor manager was great last year, but now there's a new one and this person's not as good or they haven't contacted us, whatever that might, might be. Um, so lots of benefits there. Uh, but also some drawbacks uh, to the 1P specific strategy. Great. Bryce, on the, the next strategy is a 2P strategy. Uh, if you haven't heard of 2P, we really can call this a distributor-led strategy where you are selling into distributors and allowing those distributors to sell on your behalf. This is a little bit different than the 3P unmanaged because you know your product's being sold on Amazon. You're allowing that to happen but you don't have the involvement with Amazon. Some of the benefits on that is that you then don't have to deal with Amazon or any negotiations with them. And often your distributors will be working on pretty thin margins. And so you can say, uh, hey, let's sell on Amazon. I'll give you a minimum margin. You go do all the things and I'm just gonna sell to you uh, like I would for any other marketplace, whether it's Amazon or even brick and mortar in Walmart or Home Depot or somewhere else. So those are some of the benefits on this distributor model. Uh, the biggest challenge that I would focus on is the lack of control under this model. You are selling your products to a distributor and saying, you go own this and manage this. Now that works with some distributors. With other distributors, they may not be marketplace experts. We focus a lot in this training on Amazon, uh, but this could be any marketplaces that they sell on. If you don't have the experts who are on there listing your detail page, setting and maintaining pricing. Uh, they're the ones that you're leaning on to be able to do all of this expertise. And if you don't have distributors who are experts, it might be a relatively inexpensive way to sell on Amazon. However, it can be challenging to say they are going to represent your brand on your behalf. So it's a lot about control on the 2P side. Now 3P is the inverse where you are now selling the product to the customer, as Bryce had mentioned on the slide before. And the main piece is that you do own control. You are in full control of this. You are the retailer essentially. Now on the three piece side, uh, you are the one that's gonna update listings, content. You will have that direct line into Amazon. You're gonna be the one that has the brand registry ownership and you will be able to do a lot more within Amazon yourself. You also cut out any middlemen involved in this, which means you have the potential for higher margins, which can be a benefit if you know what you're doing and you're doing it really well and efficiently. 
Now, a few of the drawbacks, this is a three-piece side. Now, a lot of brands that we talk to, we talk to several brands who are on Amazon. One of the interesting things about Amazon is that they can sometimes make it challenging to sell on Amazon. If you look at what Amazon's doing and the scale they are working at, the only way that they can do that is by setting up scalable processes that they need brands to adhere to. Because of those processes, you have to know what those are or you could be delisted. You have to understand how to follow them or you may receive chargebacks. All of those things require additional resources and capabilities to understand how to operate on the Amazon marketplace, then replicate that for the Walmart marketplace. And then if you look in other countries across Zalando or Shopee or Lazada, do you have the expertise and the resources to sell on those marketplaces as well? So the third party side, the major drawbacks are gonna say, I have to own the inventory, sell it in, I get paid when the customer buys it. And then I need the investments into additional resources and expertise to be able to sell there. If you don't have those resources or expertise, you either need to look at hiring those in or look at one of these next few options that Bryce will talk about. Yeah, and we'll go through hybrid and 3P partner, but thank you, Casey. I, I think one thing to call out across all of these, maybe not the Wild West or unmanaged, but you do need someone or a team or something internally who's watching over it. Uh, and the level of expertise and involvement varies by the strategy that you, that you take on. Um, but for the most part, none of these are just a hands-off, our stuff's on Amazon and it just sells itself. Um, whether that be managing ads and content or you know, someone's got to look at the POs that Amazon's placing and making sure that everything's in stock. There are varying degrees of involvement from the brand itself in each of these. Uh, and so that, that's something to just keep in mind as you think about these. Uh, let's talk about hybrids. This is one we're seeing become more popular. Uh, this is where you're leveraging both 1P and 3P. Uh, that could be for a lot of different reasons. Um, one of the first reasons that came up uh, when we started to see hybrid pop up was just a backup offer. So 1P has product in the warehouse, but you don't want to ever run out of stock. And so the brand itself adds a seller account and they have additional inventory sitting in their warehouse that kicks in if the 1P account runs out. That's one version of a hybrid strategy on Amazon. Uh, but we also see it for different reasons, such as, such as products that get less attention. Uh, and this might, again, be the brand itself that says, we've got some tail products that aren't getting as much attention. They're not getting ordered from Amazon. And we think that we can do uh, a little more with them. And so we're going to load those onto a three-piece seller account. Uh, sometimes that brand is also using a partner or you know, a, a different agency, a different seller um, to take on that hybrid piece uh, separate to the one piece. But it gives you, um, I guess we say mitigated risk. It gives you a diversified offering on Amazon. Uh, it gives you a little bit of control uh, because you have 1P and 3P. You know that it's not going to drop off one or the other. But the risks there, obviously, you're spreading yourself a little thin. So you have multiple strategies coming into one. And how do you manage that? And what goes where? And is it based on the product itself? Or is it a backup offering? Um, but you also risk, and, and um, we'll call this out, the 3P side getting shut down. We hear this a lot from brands where they say, well, I have a seller account. I'm trying to load new products. But Amazon's not letting me load the new products on that one. They're forcing me to do it on the 1P side. And so there's these little nuances that um, you might run into if you're trying to do both. And especially if you're trying to load uh, the same products on each one, that's gonna be a red flag internally to Amazon systems of what are you trying to do here? So be careful with that. But this is an, an approach that we're seeing become more and more popular, especially with large brands um, that have been on Amazon for a long time. And then the last one to the far right, 3P Partner, that is where someone like a pattern would come into play. Now, when we say a 3P partner, we don't mean you sell directly to Amazon and you have an ad agency that helps you with your ad strategy. A 3P partner in this sense would be someone who actually buys your product uh, and represents you on the platform, whether it be Amazon or something else. Um, so in patterns case, we do buy at a wholesale price from the brands that we work with. 
And then we sell that product for them on Amazon, Walmart, other marketplaces in the US and across the globe. Um, benefits that you get there, uh, these partners, hopefully, uh, and in Pattern's case, I would say yes, are, are experts in whatever that marketplace is. Wherever they're willing to represent you, they should be experts in what that platform represents, the tools that are needed, the changes that are being made, uh, and from an economy of sale and uh, uh, economies of scale perspective, they just they have some advantages because they're doing a lot of um, sell, selling through that platform. There's additional resources, so you should view that as an extension to your team. So you still do need someone internally that's watching it, um, but they now become the coach and a, and a pattern or another partner becomes the players that are kind of doing the execution side. Uh, from a drawbacks perspective, potentially lower margin. It just depends, to be perfectly honest. There are benefits along the path, even you know logistics and the ad strategy. And there are ways that you can pull some of that back. But um, you want to look at the margin, obviously. And then not as much direct control. So even though you might have someone internally who's watching it and who's focusing on it, um, they are not going to manage everything. And so you may not have the day-to-day -day expertise and control that you would in some of the other models. Um, before we move on from the slide, I do want to call out uh, that there is not a one-size-fits-all approach. And it's not if you're a consumer electronics brand, you should be 1P. But if you're via a vitamins and supplements brand, you should be 3P. There are benefits and drawbacks to all of these. And the other thing I would say is you can make money and be successful on Amazon in all of these. Uh, and so you really have to understand what are the strengths and potential opportunities for your brand and then pick a strategy that fits with that. And the goal with this webinar is really to help you understand what your options are and not to tell you what to do. Uh, one of the big things we see with brands is they don't always understand the options. And if you're just if you're not educated on the options, it's very hard to do the right approach for your brand. So we just want to call that out. I'm going to sure. turn quick. Go ahead, Casey. Quick, yeah, before we leave this framework, let's leave it up here. Uh, we've got a couple of questions or comments here in the Q&A. Maybe you can help tackle this first one and I'll jump into the next one. But the first question was, how can 1P block 3P? If you're 1P only, you cannot prevent 3P sellers from joining. Maybe you can talk through um, how we uh, address that typically a pattern or think through that. Yeah, so they don't block all 3P sellers from selling on Amazon. Uh, where we see it pop up is brand A is 1P and brand A creates a seller account that is named brand A and it's, and it's run by brand A. And then you start to try and add new products to the seller account, but not to the 1P account. That's a flag in the system to say, why are you doing that? Why are you loading them over here, but not over here? That's where we tend to see the quote unquote block of the 3P seller. Um, we do not see that with a third part, true third party, uh, which could be a third party partner. It could be just some random seller from who knows where that's selling the product. Uh, so the, the blocking tends to be the brand itself trying to do both strategies uh, and running into issues there. I don't know if Casey, you have other insights to that. Yeah, I think that's helpful. I think that clears up some of the question there. Um, on the, If you are trying to limit the third party sellers, which I think is where the question uh, may be saying versus what you said, Bryce, into can I limit third party sellers? The answer is- Oh yeah. And what several brands will do, though, is they'll work with different legal agencies to set up some reseller policies and then try to enact or enforce reseller policies that way. So that's how we've seen other people block them from coming onto one e or onto Amazon in other ways. But that's not something we get involved with. That would be between the brand and their uh, legal reseller policy. Now, another question that was brought up was how common is it to have an Amazon vendor manager? Is there generally a dollar threshold? Um, let me give my uh, experience, my thoughts on here, Bryce, and you can share yours. Um, this is going to differ by category. Now, it's different. When I first started my career in a brick and mortar retailer, I managed maybe five to eight brands or vendors. 
when I went to Amazon, there were thousands on my 1P list. Obviously, I couldn't manage all of those. So I did rank those from top to bottom based on revenue. And I would give the most attention to those at the highest revenue amounts because they would mix shift into my P&L over any others. So yes, typically it, you're gonna get attention from a vendor manager, the higher revenue you are. Uh, again, it might differ by subcategory. I would say a general rule of thumb is probably around the $15 million mark or above, you become a lot more relevant to a vendor manager. Bryce, any thoughts from your experience? Yeah, I'd say I'd agree with that. The only caveat would be it also depends on the category um, because the sizing will be different. You know, there are certain categories where there's brands that are 100 million or more uh, on Amazon and there's certain categories that that doesn't exist as, as often. Uh, and so it comes down to what share of the category and the traffic do you represent for that vendor manager specifically? And so as Casey said, they're kind of in rank file and they know who the top ones are and that, that's kind of how that comes together. Thanks, Bryce. Uh, let's address the, the top one that was put on there. Ali, I appreciate you putting one on early uh, quickly, but it says it's been challenging these days onboarding brands in the USA despite having a 500K budget. And um, just to address that quickly, when I joined Amazon in 2013, you still had some of that like out of your garage seller type um, uh, activity that I would say is rare today. Uh, Amazon is now a sophisticated marketplace. Uh, we will talk a little bit about it, kind of the gamification of e-commerce and marketplaces in general. Uh, but yeah, it, this is not a... Um, you know, random product that you start with a hundred dollar budget type thing anymore. Amazon is a sophisticated marketplace and um, you have to kind of know how, where, when to play in order to grow a brand. And so I, I think that's just a call out there. Um, Casey, we've got a bunch of questions. I want to make sure we get through slides. Were there any that you're seeing that we should, that we should address right now? Yeah, I think we're going to address uh, several of these as we keep going, but one quick one is there's a question on a hybrid model in Mexico and Brazil, any nuances in those marketplaces? Uh, maybe my quick thoughts on that one are that I don't believe Amazon loves the hybrid model. That's not something they want to happen a lot. A lot of brands find ways that they try to do that. So I would say, yes, you could do it in Mexico and Brazil unless to the drawbacks portion there, Amazon decides they want to shut that down if you have a 1P model and you open up your own 3P store. So I think the risks would be the same in the US as they would be in Mexico, Brazil, or anywhere else across the world. Yeah. Okay, let's um, let's keep going. We will get to, I, I'm looking at the other questions. We will get to a lot of those as we go and we'll make sure that we get those answered throughout the presentation. Just to quickly hit on, you know, we talked about the different types, 1P, 3P, different levels uh, of each one. Um, this is just a call out that regardless of what your strategy is currently, as you look at international growth, especially and domestic growth, but as you look at international growth, especially, um, there are very large marketplaces that only have 3P. Uh, so Alibaba being the largest of so Tmall in China, it is 3P only. Uh, and so depending on where your product sells and where you want to go, uh, especially for expansion reasons, you may have to entertain a 3P model in some form, whether that be you or through a partner. Uh, so just to call that out, these are not all of the marketplaces across the world, but these are a few that we hear about a lot. Um, and you know what they currently offer on their platforms. Okay, so let's continue on that uh, that vein. So 3P, um, and the goal of this again is not to tell you that you should be 3P. We're trying to help you understand how big of a player 3P is now on Amazon specifically. Um, 3P has grown a lot over the years to where now from a unit's perspective, in most categories, it is above 60% and from a revenue perspective, uh, above 60% uh, share of the category units and dollars. Uh, so that doesn't mean you should sell 3P, 
but it means you should understand it. And we're going to use this as an example um, to call out. So there are a lot of brands that were created in the brick and mortar world, and they grew up in the brick and mortar world, and now they've migrated some of their business onto marketplaces like Amazon and e-commerce. And they are, in some cases, somewhat stuck in the brick and mortar world and trying to navigate both. In some cases, they are putting a full strategy toward the e-commerce side, but they still have their roots in that traditional retail atmosphere. Um, but we're starting to see a lot of brands pop up that are started and growing up in e-commerce specifically. And in some cases, then starting on e-commerce and transitioning into brick and mortar. Um, this is Wee Wee Faucet. Many of you have probably never heard of them. Uh, but they are quite large in the faucet space and a brand that if you were looking in a, I'll say, I'll use Home Depot as an example. If you walk down the, the aisle at Home Depot, you are probably not going to see a Wee Wee Faucet next to a Delta and a Moen Faucet. And so from a you know big brick and mortar retail brand perspective, they never show up on the competitive radar of those other brands. But when you look at what we call the digital shelf, so on Amazon, you don't have a physical shelf, but there is a digital shelf and it's an unlimited shelf, which makes it even more complicated. When you look on the digital shelf, Wee Wee Faucet is a big competitor for those large faucet brands. And so what we show you here is actually our free tool. You can go on pattern.com. This is under resources. You can do this for yourself. Uh, but we show you a few things. So just who, who are your top competitors? You can type in your own product. You can type in other products. It'll show you who your top five competitors are. It shows you a longer list as well. It shows you things like the average price point, daily impressions. Um, but also something to look at is keywords in the top four, uh, meaning how often does this brand show up in the organic top four listings uh, for specific keywords? And what you'll see with this one is uh, Wee Wee Faucet in the bottom left for this specific product is showing up in 121 keywords in the top four organically. Whereas these top five competitors, the highest one is 109, which is also another uh, kind of e-commerce brand. And then it goes down from there. And so Wee Wee Faucet is double or triple um, the organic placement in the top four than its highest competitors. Uh, and so Casey, I know is going to hit on this even more because he knows this brand really well, but it's an example of a, of a brand that's playing the game really well. And they grew up in the e-commerce space and they're really, really smart at how they play that game. Casey, why don't you give a little more color to it? Yeah, this is a, this is a brand that I saw come up as I was a vendor manager in the home improvement space. And all of the large players that Bryce, you mentioned, the Delta faucets, the uh, Kohlers, the Moens, those would be the ones you would see and expect to see in the big box retail stores. These big brands wouldn't know who Wee Wee Faucet is. And if you asked what any of those brands, you would say, who are your top competitors? They would probably share amongst themselves those big brands that are in the brick and mortar store. If they would have gone to this digital shelf view, they could they would have seen OFAM, Forios, HGN, Keysim Pro, brands they probably never heard of or thought of. But this is who Amazon is surfacing up as the digital shelf competitors. So it's theoretically, as the brand goes into their store, anytime this ASIN is shown to a customer, these are the other products that are most closely tied to it on the search page, as well as most often shown on there. One other quick note, just in that keywords in the top four point that you made, Bryce. The reason we highlight that is because we found that over 60% of all of the search goes to those top four organic spots or above. So if you can win in those top four organic spots or above, you're doing well on getting the actual share of search in those different search terms. And we combine over millions of search terms that we look at daily we combine those over a month period of time and aggregate them to see who's showing up when this ASIN is shown up or when any of your other ASINs on the digital shelf are showing up. So we find it very important 
if you're one of those big players like a Moen or Kohler to say, hey, I'm going to understand who my digital shelf is and how they're competing. And you need to look at price points, ratings, reviews. We have a lot on here. But evaluate all of those when you're looking at your competition and not just think, who is my brick and mortar normal competition? And that's going to help you understand, are they playing on the third party side? Uh, the first party side or some combination. Thanks, Casey. And yeah, just a quick um, separate example to this I saw in Lawn and Garden, there's a brand called Greenworks that popped up that did um, battery powered outdoor power tools, lawnmowers, things like that. I'd never heard of them. Um, they were impressive when we talked to them. We brought them onto Amazon 1P. They started selling, doing really well. Now they're really strong in brick and mortar but they kind of came and became a really big brand on e-commerce with no one noticing and then moved their way into the brick and mortar side. And so that's where we just call it out, understand what your digital shelf looks like, because whether it's now, later, one way or the other, it's important to know who these brands are and just keep an eye on them from a competition standpoint. Okay, we're gonna jump into 1P versus 3P benefits quick and then get into some of the numbers, I think. Casey, you want to take this one? Yeah, I think some of the questions that have been asked, I'll try to answer throughout this um, slide as well. Now, many brands, when they look at our framework that we shared a couple slides ago, they might say, okay, let's get a layer deeper. So we created this view for brands to say, let's look at some of the four benefits that we found on the 1P side and the 3P side and share a little bit more insight there. So on the one piece side, one of the major things that brands tend to love is the, you get the ships from and sold by Amazon terminology in the buy box, right below your selling price. And that breeds some confidence within the customer or consumer on you buying the product, feeling like Amazon's buying it, I'm gonna get it quick, and I can trust that it's gonna be a good product. So there's some in, you know, inherent trust there. Now, what we found on the third party side is the real benefit comes from it saying shipped from Amazon or making sure it's prime eligible. You're going to get over about a 40% lift in conversion benefit by having it prime eligible versus non-prime eligible. So the key part is making sure that you have it shipped from Amazon or it's prime eligible as well. But the sold by Amazon can provide some benefits to some customers. You do get the upfront POs where Amazon will buy the inventory from you and you can work at the COGS basis rather than your GMV or you're selling it to the customer at the end. Um, then we talked a little bit about this vendor manager support piece of it. If you can get a vendor manager to provide you good, strong support, there can be benefits through beta tests or merchandising programs. They can provide additional support or insights from within Amazon. To the question we had earlier, if you're not one of the top brands, then you may not get that support. You could then apply for the SaaS program or ABS program and get yourself a CSM. Um, outside of that though, you, if you're large enough, you can get that support and there can be benefits there. They do rotate frequently. Um, and sometimes you may love your vendor manager, sometimes you may not. Uh, the last few pieces is the price competitively and crap products. Those kind of go together hand in hand. Now, some brands hate this, some love it. But if you're open to allowing your price to go up and down all over the place, Amazon will match it. If you sell it to them, they will make sure that you are one of the lowest prices out in the market and uh, you'll win the buy box at a high rate because of that. They also may sell some of your products that are considered crap items. Now, crap stands for can't realize a profit, C-R-A-P. Uh, that just means Amazon's losing money on it but they may value that product so highly that they're gonna to continue to sell it. And I even worked in some categories where there were subcategories that we lost money on at Amazon, but we valued the product so highly on making sure it was relevant and is there for the customer that we were willing to lose money. Uh, now shifting gears to the third party side briefly. Uh, Bryce, hey Casey, me? can I interrupt you before you? Yeah. There's a question on, do 1P vendors get priority advertising or how do we think about advertising placement opportunities within these strategies? I know you talked about merchandising programs. Do you want to hit on that one quick? Yeah, it's interesting from an advertising standpoint. Um, 
it doesn't matter how good your advertising strategy is if you're not winning the buy box. And whoever is winning the buy box, that's who is going to be able to advertise on that product, whether you're 1P or 3P. So the key is to have some sort of buy box strategy where you are in the buy box. You then control the content, but also drive all the advertising strategy as well. Any other point on that, Bryce? Uh, I, I guess it'd be good to address. I think there's a, a myth that 1P gets for like Black Friday or, you know, specific events that there's things set aside for 1P that you'll never have an opportunity to get into on 3P. Did you ever see that in your time at Amazon? Um, early on, I saw that. I think Amazon tried to level the playing field uh, while we were there. So I saw them try to give equal opportunity to both sides. They may occasionally give uh, some preferential treatment to one or the other. Um, maybe just us being on the one piece side, we may have seen some of those times where there may have been some on the one piece side, uh, but they've really tried to level the playing field there for sure. What they want is the big brands advertise there and run across all those major promotions. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think it's more about, they want the product that's gonna be the best performer, get the most eyes, potentially spend the most on the advertising position. Um, early on in my time, there were definitely some slots reserved, but uh, I don't think we see that uh, possibly at all uh, anymore. So, yep. All right, as we look at the major benefits of the 3P, we've talked through some of these, but I'll wrap it up, I think, in a high level way of saying on the third party side, you gain back control. That's gonna be the high level benefit is you get control over your pricing, you get control over inventory, where you're sending it, uh, how much to send in. You uh, have control over a lot more than you do when you sell it to someone else. Now, one caution on that with the map adherence is Amazon still may suppress your product if you're not matching the lowest price sellers. So you need to be able to say, I've got the control. However, I may lose the buy box if I'm not uh, addressing that and be having the CX requirements that Amazon wants you to have on the third party side. Um, another benefit that was interesting for me when I left the one P side of the world is I heard from almost every seller that seller central was better than vendor central. And it's been interesting to see the additional uh, insights you can get in seller central. Now on the one P side, they are trying to make vendor central better and improve it. But I think as we've, gone out and surveyed several different brands. Almost every one of them have told us that they believe they get a lot more out of Seller Central than Vendor Central. Um, the, one of the other things you get on the third party side is you don't have to have AVN. Uh, some people are okay with that. Some people like it. A lot of people hate it. When I first came to Pattern, someone called me the devil because they were in the middle of AVN and I just left from the vendor manager world and uh, they did not like it. So you don't deal with those on the third party side. Um, your products don't get crapped out, uh, quote unquote. Um, the flip side of Amazon selling crap items is they may also crap it out, which just means they won't buy your products because they can't realize a profit about it uh, from it. And then the last piece is that you get a little bit more information about your consumer on the third party side. Now the benefits on this third party side all apply to the third party managed accelerator piece. But we did want to spend a quick minute to highlight, as a lot of brands will ask us, well, what do you get from a third-party accelerator standpoint? So, Bryce, maybe you can dive into that. Yeah, like Casey said, all the stuff on the 3 piece side where there's a few additional uh, extras. The piece I would call out before jumping in specifically is to make sure that whoever that partner or accelerator is can actually do these things and they are an expert. Uh, so you'll want to do your homework and, and, and your due diligence there. Big one that we hear a lot, no chargebacks or shortage claims. So that accelerator, that partner should take care of those things for you. You don't have to deal with, and I'll just say the day-to-day -day stuff that is required when you work with Amazon, either 1P or 3P. Um, added resources. So it should be an extension to your team. Um, again, I said it earlier, Become your, your, your team becomes the coach and the accelerator becomes the players doing that day-to-day -day execution piece. Specialized expertise, you know, these should be companies like Pattern that this is what they do. They know the ins and outs of how to get what is needed, how to do it, how to perform at the at the highest level and optimize. Um, you're getting a few of the, I would say, 1P advantages, upfront POs, 
some reduced complexity. You kind of have that inside view or you, you know, like a pattern, we have a weekly call with Amazon, we have direct communication with them. And so that does eliminate some of the gray area or the unknown that comes with it. Um, that goes with the number six, the account health expertise. You'd be surprised how often this happens. Uh, there are you know, new regulations, new rules, new guidelines that happen on an ongoing basis and depending on the category much more frequently than others. Um, an accelerator like a pattern tends to find out either sooner or have some way of recovering faster when those things come into play. Uh, we actually try to share those with our trade organization partners just to make sure that brands, even if they don't work with us, have access to it. But that's a big one. Um, getting your account shut off is not fun, uh, but it can happen. And so you want to have a way to get around that. Um, and then just the, the globalization or the global growth. So hopefully being able to then um, grow not only domestically, but internationally. So these are a few of the, the advantages or the benefits of working with a partner or an accelerator like a pattern. Um, I'll address, I guess it goes with that, but just to hit some of the questions, there's a lot around like map. Um, how do you win the buy box or best practices there? How do you, you know, manage the other wholesale companies that are selling your product? And I would say that the theme with a lot of that, um, there's not a silver bullet, unfortunately, but a lot of it has to do with your own best practices and distribution. Uh, so, who are you selling to? In some cases, it's very exciting to just get POs from multiple buyers. Uh, and it can be tempting to just sell to whoever wants your product. The problem is three, six, 12 months down the road, those products are going to pop up on Amazon. And so the cleanliness of your channel, of your distribution is a big one for how do you get customers to comply? How do you win the buy box? How do you get people to comply with MAP? The other piece I would say, and uh, we work with, the, with an outside legal firm that helps with some of this, is you've got to have your ducks in a row and the documentation for all of those distributors that you work with that tells them you are authorized to sell in these channels, but not in these. And as weird as it sounds, we've even sent letters to like a Walmart that says, Walmart, you are allowed to sell on walmart.com. And, you know, that's an obvious one, but it's so that in the future, if there's any issues, you can say, we sent this to everyone. It wasn't just you that was, you know, singled out, but everyone that we sell to has received a letter of authorization of where they are allowed to sell our products. That's going to make it easier to track down who the bad apples are, those unauthorized sellers, and actually uh, have a way to enforce it. Um, but what we see in most cases is that hasn't been done. And so then the channel gets really dirty and the cleanup takes much longer because those pieces now have to be put in place after the problem already exists. And it makes it that much harder down the road. Casey, I don't know if you have any additional feedback on that one. No, I, I just appreciated when I came to pattern on trying to provide some direction or support on helping brands know where to go in that. Uh, my stance as a vendor manager was go clean up your distribution. <laughs> we, you know, we reserve the right to price independently. And that should be the case at anywhere is anyone buying your product will have the independent pricing uh, ability to do that. So it's up to brands to have their own reseller policies in place. They need to work with outside legal firms like uh, we recommend other brands to do as well. Maybe one other question on there, Bryce, just before you leave the last slide, you mentioned the, the global growth there. There's a question around some different marketplaces like the UAE. Um, just to make a quick comment there, I'm a big fan of several of these international marketplaces that will allow your ratings and reviews to port over. Yeah. It can give instant credibility if you're already selling on Amazon in the US, for example, and if those ratings and reviews can move over to the UAE, that can be a fantastic way to help generate and get yourself up the search rankings as well, which is awesome. So at Pattern, we work uh, across all the EU marketplaces, UAE, Australia, Japan, um, the US, Canada, Mexico, the Amazon world, plus additional marketplaces, uh, not Amazon world, especially in China and other uh, countries there. But the global growth is a thing. It's a massive thing that you should be considering. 
one of the key factors or maybe a couple of key factors to consider on there is if you're in Amazon today, the Amazon world is gonna be very similar. So it's a great place and a great way to expand on Amazon. You do need to make sure that you meet both Amazon and country specific regulatory requirements. That's usually the number one issue blocking brands. You also need to make sure you have language and labeling requirements met, which can be part of that. And then you need to know how you're gonna get your product there and distribute it. Those are some of the key factors as you're looking globally. Yeah, and just one extra comment on that is it's very tempting, but you can also spend a lot of money and not get much revenue if you do it the wrong way. And so make sure that that temptation is done the right way with data, with you know educated understanding of where your brand would perform the most. Because we have seen, unfortunately, brands fall into that trap where they, they spend a lot of money to expand and it, and it didn't work right. So, yeah. All right, let's get into it then. Casey, take yeah. it away. One of the key questions that we get is, if I'm on 1P today, can I move to 3P or whatnot? Now, we don't have the silver bullet. Bryce and I don't work at Amazon anymore. We don't work for the Amazon Standards for Brands team, but we like to educate people on this team and what the requirements are. The Amazon Standards for Brands team was set up to help make sure that whoever's selling the product are meeting these core CX metrics or customer experience metrics. And if you've ever sold or bought on Amazon, these will all make sense to you. Amazon wants to ensure that if a customer goes to purchase on Amazon, that they are gonna see a very competitive price. So they have this 95% pricing compliance as they scrape other websites and they usually will scrape large uh, websites or brick and mortar stores. They'll scrape their sites um, regularly, you know, daily, could be hourly, depending on the size and the relevance to your product. But they're going to scrape for price competitiveness, and you need to make sure that you can maintain that benchmark of 95% competitive or above over a trailing 90-day period of time. Another key thing for them is prime eligibility. They want the customer to be able to get the product at an inexpensive price or the best price they can get, as well as at the fastest speed. So prime eligibility is their way of helping to offer this speed. And some of the changes made on the third party side with them charging brands if you don't send it to enough uh, fulfillment centers, seems like it's largely driving around this ability to get product to customers faster. So they want products that are prime eligible and shipping at a very high rate. And then you have to have it in stock. Like I said before, it doesn't matter how well your detail page looks or how awesome your strategy is for advertising. If it's not in stock, it doesn't matter. It's not gonna be shown, it's not gonna be relevant. So keeping a high benchmark there. Now for products that are, if you flip to the next slide, Bryce, for their non-FBA products, they have some core delivery speeds. So it's split up in two groups, standard size products and non-standard size products. Uh, you can look up the dimensions of those online of what standard size and non-standard would be, but non-standard are large, heavy, bulky products typically. And they have different benchmarks of making sure that the products, even though they're not shipping FBA, they're shipping FBM, which means fulfilled by merchant. So you ship out of your own warehouse or garage or where you're shipping from. They wanna make sure that a certain percentage of those products still arrive within their benchmarks of shipping speed. And those two day metric has kind of been their core foundation. They're trying to move that up and get even faster and faster as they go. Casey, do you want to hit the, there's a question in the chat. Does uh, SFP currently exist as an option for 3P sellers? If so, how does a company go about obtaining this? Uh, yes, seller fulfilled prime metrics. Uh, you can be a seller fulfilled prime seller. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but before I left a few years ago, they really ratcheted down on those metrics. And it seemed like the vast majority of all sellers who were selling seller fulfilled prime uh, were kicked off because they have to be able to get a product shipped within uh, hours of an order coming in and arriving to a customer within their metrics. So it's one of those where they test you, see if you can meet it at a certain level. They ratchet that up even further and further and further until they get you to the standard. And you only have, a, I believe, like three strikes or so until you're out because they that core trust with the customer is paramount. So you can reach out to Amazon if you want to be able to do the seller fulfilled prime um, option, 
that's uh, something that I would love to see more brands do, but it's typically difficult for brands who don't want to sell seven days a week or who don't can't ship and turn around orders within hours. Okay, the last few minutes of our uh, webinar here, we want to just show a PL view for you on the one P side and the three P side. Uh, Bryce and I have managed a lot of brands on the one P side, and now on the third party side, we work with a lot of brands. And it was surprising to me how different of a view that is. So we've tried to take it upon ourselves to educate brands on what this looks like from a one P PL and then how to compare that to an Amazon third party PL. So if you do this analysis yourself, you can look and say, am I better off financially on the 1P side or the 3P side? To give a quick overview of the 1P p &L, you have their PPM, which the equation for that is revenue minus cost divided by revenue. Very simple, that's the wholesale price. So whatever you sell it to Amazon for. The net PPM is the same equation, but it adds in the accruals or co-op, you may call it. So you have the revenue minus cost plus accruals divided by your total revenue. That gets the net PPM. Now that's the metric that most brands will negotiate with Amazon during AVN is around that metric. However, there's some cost below there that Amazon incurs that hit an operating or a vendor margin, uh, which can be a lot of the operational cost of shipping the products and selling it. So that gets down to Amazon's core uh, CM margin below the line. Now, below Amazon's cost, you as a seller on Amazon will have your own cost that you're paying for to manage the Amazon world. You're going to look at different agency fees. You're going to have ads or creative agencies. You're likely going to pay for data and insights where you're going to need providers to understand the Amazon world. You might have pricing compliance software or legal teams that support your compliance efforts or the operations work that costs. Those are all outside of the Amazon p and but definitely costs that you're incurring that you need to evaluate. And then you've got miscellaneous costs uh, below the fold. Amazon does so well with AVN, they started up AON, which means always on negotiations. Um, they're gonna continue to find ways to help support the growth on Amazon, and sometimes that's through profitability. Now on the third party side, it's a little bit different and we'll share a quick visual. We'll have an opportunity at the end of this for you to click a little QR code if you wanna reach out and get an example like this. Uh, we build something out where I've got that 1P p &L on the left-hand side of your view, what I just walked through. And then for brands that are potentially looking to work or partner with Pattern, we've got the third-party side of the view on the right-hand side. It's a little simpler on the right-hand side where you're just saying, what's your purchase price? And then you can look at any additional costs of shipping the product into pattern or the advertising spend is gonna happen on both sides. Uh, you got the returns or a damage cost that you'll look at separately. And then any of the promotions you'll run either way. Typically with Amazon on the one piece side, they'll, if you're funding your promotion, if you're fully funding, you'll fund the dollar amount. If you're partnering with someone, they usually want to be margin whole and not receive the full dollar amounts. So there's sometimes a benefit there on the third party side. But if you are interested, this is kind of our call to action at the end of this for diving into 1P and 3P on the P&L standpoint, feel free to go ahead and click this QR code. We're happy to provide support. We just want to be helpful to anyone who's looking at either one of these options, 1P or 3P. There's a lot of ways to look at this, a lot of things to figure out. The financial part is one of them, but just one of a lot of things to review. So hopefully with a lot of what Bryce and I have been able to go through today, you're able to consider a lot of different elements that go into deciding if you want to be on the 1P side, selling 3P side, hybrid, or somewhere between. Yeah, and I just end by saying thank you to everyone. Great questions. Casey, thank you for your contributions as well. Um, Again, the big thing here is we want brands to know their options and be educated about them. It is not a one size fits all solution. Um, there are reasons why one brand should do one versus the other, and that could be different for a, a, a separate brand that maybe is even in the same space. 
Uh, and so for any of you who are over e-commerce for your brands, just know the differences, know what the options are. Even as you look at the P&L, uh, we so often hear brands tell us, oh, well, this, ha this is how much it costs me to be on Amazon. And we'll ask them, like, do you use an agency? Do you have market share data? Do you have this? Oh, yeah, we pay for that. We pay for that. And they just don't consider those in the cost of doing business. And so really breaking that all the way down um, is, is just super helpful, even if you stick with this exact same strategy that you're doing today, but just to feel fully engaged and educated about the why behind it is very important. Okay, uh, we appreciate it. We're out of time. Um, please reach out. The QR code is on the screen. We are, as Casey said, we are more than happy to help with anything, uh, whether you're a partner of ours or not. Um, but we we love doing this. Um, having been on both sides of the you know the Amazon side and now on the accelerator side, it's a lot of fun for us, and we're happy to talk about whatever your needs might be. But we appreciate everybody joining, and hope you have a great day. Thanks all.